Hello, friends. Thank you for joining me again tonight. You know, it's hard to believe that Christmas is almost here. And obviously, this is going to be a very different Christmas than any of us have ever had before, thanks to COVID and who knows what else. Maybe it's not quite as busy with people staying home and many churches not having their normal Christmas events. More shopping will definitely be done online. Maybe less shopping will be done due to money problems. Maybe it'll be a more somber Christmas because you've lost somebody or you've suffered some personal pain. But no matter how you look at it, it's going to be very different. But Christmas itself, the true meaning of Christmas, the Christ of Christmas, well, he'll never change. So as always, let's focus on Jesus. I love the study of names in the Bible because they reveal so much to us. And God uses names to reveal himself to us. With names like Jehovah and Elohim and Adonai and so many more names. And the same is true about the Lord Jesus. They're like portraits and, and promises to us. And each name unlocks another aspect of his nature or his work and his personality. Someone once said that every name he bears is a blessing he shares. So we're going to begin with a familiar name from the prophet Isaiah and see if we can get some Christmas blessings out of them. We're going to start with Isaiah 9 and verse 6, where Isaiah gives us four names or four titles for the Son of God. Very familiar. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You know, we usually pick names for our children right before they're born. But Isaiah gave these names to Jesus 700 years before he was born. Now, time really prohibits me from going into the whole context of Isaiah's prophecy. But Matthew's gospel shows us that Isaiah's prophecy is speaking specifically of the Lord Jesus. Matthew chapter 4 and verses 12 through 17 tells us, and I quote, now when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali were the northernmost tribes of, the, of Israel when Assyria invaded in 722 B.C., and Isaiah tells of a time in the future where gloom will be replaced with gladness in Galilee, and they will go from darkness to light. Now, when Jesus came, Israel was in great darkness. They lived under the oppression of the Roman Empire. Herod was their puppet king, and the religious leaders oppressed the people spiritually with their self-righteous interpretation and administration of the law. Now, Jesus' arrival on the earth was the light of God shining upon men. Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, prophesied that he had come. Luke 179 said to, to give light to those who sit in darkness. John's gospel calls him the light of men. And Jesus himself said he was the light of the world. So Christmas is celebrated as, as a recognition of the light of God coming to shine in a world darkened by sin. It should really be no surprise to us that there is such animosity fueled by this politically correct culture over the mention of Christ and anything else Christian at Christmas. Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, and this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. Unbelieving men will always find offense with Jesus because his light betrays the, the darkness of their heart. They will either have to repent and seek God's forgiveness 
through faith in Christ, or they will reject the light and somehow try to extinguish it. And of course, we know that they will never be able to do that, but the majority of mankind will definitely try. Because Jesus said, men love darkness. That's the very reason they crucified him. Now, Isaiah chapter 6 describes how the coming Messiah will bring great joy and break the yoke of bondage from all oppressors, whether political or spiritual, and establish universal peace. And as we come to verse 6, God reveals his plan through this incredible description of Messiah's arrival and his divine nature. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now notice that both his humanity and his deity are revealed here as he says, for unto us a child is born. That's his humanity. Although all the circumstances around his birth were unique, he was born into the world as a human, just like all of us. But when it says to us a son is given, well, that's his deity. He is God's gift of his own son to the world. So with that simple declaration of the uniqueness of Jesus Christ, he is declared to be both fully man and fully God. And on top of that, it says that the government will be upon his shoulder. And this means that all of the messianic hopes and expectations found in the scriptures are fulfilled in him. And to confirm that this child is worthy, able, and powerful enough to rule his kingdom, Isaiah gives us four descriptive names or titles to attribute to the Messiah. And he says, and his name will be called, first of all, Wonderful Counselor. Now, some scholars break these two names up, and I'm okay with that because his name is wonderful, isn't it? But I believe there's a pattern here of pairing words. He is a wonderful counselor. It could be translated literally as a wonder of a counselor. Now, the word wonderful refers to actions that are beyond the bounds of the human ability and, and can also be translated as amazing or extraordinary. In Judges chapter 13 and verse 18, it is translated as incomprehensible or beyond understanding. Psalm 118 verse 23 uses the same word and reads, the Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. And that's the kind of counselor Jesus is. He's an amazing counselor because his counsel is always perfect. He never steers you wrong. He is the wisdom of God, according to 1 Corinthians 1.24. Doesn't matter how much trouble you're in or what kind of problems you have, the counsel that Jesus provides is always going to be right. But you know, there's a lot more to his being a wonderful counselor. So what are some of the elements that make up a good counselor? Well, for one, a human counselor can't always help you because he might not always be available. But Jesus will always be there for you. You don't have to track him down. He never goes on vacation. He never sleeps nor slumbers. He's available 24-7. Secondly, you, you want somebody who's going to listen. Someone who gives you their undivided attention. Someone you know really cares. Peter tells us, he says, cast your care on him for he cares for you. You know, there's an old song we used to sing, no one understands like Jesus when the days are dark and grim. No one is so near, so dear as Jesus. Cast your every care on him. Thirdly, you want a counselor that'll tell you the truth. And Jesus will always tell you the truth because he cannot lie. Now, you may not like what he'll tell you, but he'll always tell you the truth, you know. And I know people, they'll go to different counselors until they find somebody who will tell them what they want to hear. And Jesus won't do that. He knows your heart better than you do. And he'll always correctly diagnose the problem and he'll prescribe the right course of action for you to take. And fourthly, you also want a counselor who can comfort you. And he knows perfectly how to comfort you because he understands the full extent of human suffering. Hebrews says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but, with, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 4.15. So my friends, <laughs> he's a wonderful counselor. He's also called mighty God. Literally, we could say he is the mighty, mighty one, El Gibor. There is none mightier 
David asked the question in Psalm 24, 8, Who is this King of glory, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle? He is profound in his counsel, and he has the power to accomplish what he wills. Ray Pritchard writes, as the wonderful counselor, he makes the plans. As the mighty God, he makes the plans work. And this title tells us that Jesus is not only the Son of God, but he is also God the Son. This baby born in the feeding trough is also the king of glory. Someone said that the humble carpenter of Nazareth is also the mighty architect of the universe. God asked Abraham, is anything too hard for the Lord? Genesis 18, 14. Jeremiah declared, ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. And so, my friend, if it's true of the Father, it is true of the Son. Christ's love to step into a life of chaos and not only provide wonderful counsel, but also display his divine power by bringing order to chaos. In other words, he not only tells his subjects what to do as a wonderful counselor, but he can also empower them to do it because he is the mighty God. Jesus can handle anything because he is all powerful. He healed the lame, the blind, and the sick. He performed mighty miracles. He calmed the storm. He brought Lazarus back from the grave. And therefore, he can do the impossible in your life right now. So know that Jesus, the mighty God, loves you. And he wants to display his mighty power in your life. And he wants to do it not for any selfish gain, mind you. But he wants to do it for your good and for his glory. He's a wonderful counselor. He's the mighty God, and he is the everlasting Father. Now, don't be confused with God the Father here. Literally, this can read the Father of eternity. The word Father is an ancient Hebraism, meaning possessor of or the source of, meaning that Jesus is before, above, and beyond all time. He lives in the forever. He became a, a child in time, through the incarnation, but he is the father and the possessor of eternity. In John 8, 58, Jesus said, before Abraham was, before Abraham was born, I am. He existed before Abraham, and by using the phrase I am, he declared his divinity. In other words, when he was born, he was as old as his father and older than his mother. Now think about that for a minute. Well, the idea of Jesus as an everlasting father also speaks of his tender love for us like a father would protect and care for his own children. And the fact that he is a father forever is important because all of us have or will eventually lose our fathers. All human fathers must go someday. But Jesus is a father forever, and he is just what we need. As a father of eternity, he has the right to offer eternal life to all who will trust in him for salvation. The father of eternity took upon himself the limitations of a human body so that he could bring us into, into an everlasting relationship with himself. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, the prince of peace. This phrase can literally be translated, the prince whose coming brings peace. A prince in Bible times was the general of the army and describes leadership and authority. Now, to my knowledge, there has never been a moment in human history when there has been absolute peace on this planet, except for the time Adam and Eve were in the garden before they chose to disobey God. After the fall... There has never or there has always been some kind of war or strife going on in the human heart. You know, I realize when most people think about peace, they're probably thinking about the absence of war between countries. But wars between nations take place because of the wars that go on in the human heart. And Jesus is the prince who brings peace to the heart to human hearts. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. 
My friend, no human heart is at peace with God until at first it is made right by trusting in the Prince of Peace. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, the word for peace is shalom. It refers to a state of wholeness and harmony that is intended to characterize all relationships. When used as a greeting, shalom was a wish for uh, outward freedom from disturbance as well as an inward sense of well-being. To a people constantly harassed by enemies, peace was the premier blessing. In Numbers 6, verses 24 through 26, God gave Moses these words to use when blessing his people. And may he give them to you as well. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. My friend, what a treasure is ours in Isaiah's predicted Messiah. He is our wonderful counselor, our mighty God, our everlasting father and our Prince of Peace. May we give him our worship as we ponder the great God that he is. Pray with me. Thank you, Father, for the gift of your Son. He brings so many blessings to us. Most of all, he brings us the gift of eternal life. May we find everything we need in him this Christmas. And we ask this in his blessed name. Amen. Well, thank you, my friends, for joining me. I do pray that you will find Jesus to be your all in all this Christmas. God bless you. Goodbye.